Coach Hubert Davis was fond of saying this season that there was more to be said and more to be done. Well, now that the season's over, my question is, is that still true for R.J. Davis, or has he already said and done it all? You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? It's Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. You're joining us at the place to get your Tar Heels content every single day. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you for making us your first watch or your first listen. Special shout out to all of you everydayers out there. Coming up on the show today, we're going to talk about RJ Davis's massive decision that he has ahead of him and how the timeline of that is going to impact the Tar Heels. Also, there are two freshman Tar Heels incoming for next season that were on ESPN on Tuesday night having a big old time. We'll talk about Ian Jackson and Drake Powell as well. So let's get right into this RJ Davis decision. Basically, for those who are unaware, let me just catch you up. RJ Davis has played all four years. Prior to COVID, that would mean he's done and over and out of eligibility. But RJ Davis's class was the last class that has the option to utilize a fifth year of COVID eligibility because of how his freshman year of college was impacted negatively by COVID. So if RJ so chooses, he could come back for one more season. This is probably the biggest single offseason storyline for the North Carolina Tar Heels. So I want to unpack that today and then talk about how that storyline or that the timeline of this decision affects the Tar Heels. So basically, it's just, will RJ come back or won't he? To me, it starts on this idea that it all depends on what he most desires and if there's more he wants to accomplish. Or in Hubert Davis parlance, if there's more to be said and more to be done for RJ. So let's just unpack several things here. Number one, RJ's game his basketball ability really took a step forward this year. I think there are two factors to that. Number one, he's just continued to grow year after year after year. It's just partly his growth in his game. But I think also partly because with Caleb Love moving on to Arizona and with him being replaced by Elliot Cadeau, it's just a different type of role definition that the Tar Heels had this year. And so that's that's not a positive about Elliot or a negative about Caleb. It's just the types of players where RJ and Caleb were more similar and RJ and Elliot are more complementary um, in their par- in their roles. And so I think that had a factor in it too. So I think part of that question is, is there more development that RJ could have this offseason that would affect next season for the Tar Heels? Another factor, RJ just won ACC Player of the Year. And I know it's not all about individual accolades and everything he's doing to put his name in lights, but that is a factor. It was also the most successful regular season he's had as a Tar Heel. Carolina won the regular season ACC championship outright. Obviously, they fell just short in the ACC championship game. And then also, the NCAA tournament run was clearly cut shorter than he or any of his teammates or any of us, quite frankly, expected. I mean, if you watched post-game interviews in the locker room or the post-game press conference, you saw how absolutely shell-shocked RJ was. And I would have been too in those shoes because I don't think he or his teammates expected to lose that basketball game. And also just because of the sudden finality of what the NCAA tournament does to you. But not only was the NCAA tournament um, journey for this year's Tar Heels cut short, he did not, RJ have a good game by his standards in that game. And so clearly his season didn't end the way he wanted it to. Is that enough to influence a decision? For some, it would be. For others, it might not be. Now, there's no guarantee that coming back would be more success guaranteed either for RJ as an individual or the Tar Heels as a team. Could be. Probably would be in terms of team success as Carolina just keeps continuing to grow under Hubert Davis. But also there's the factor that Armando is gone. And you have to look at that both in terms of relationship, but the special relationship that those guys shared, as well as Armando's really good freaking basketball player. So that's a part of it too. Speaking of which, another factor in RJ's decision is the fact of how much this team enjoyed one another and in 
in particular, how much RJ talked about really enjoying this group of guys and saying that this was one of the most fun years of basketball he ever had. The, the doubt in his mind that that could be replicated could be a strike against coming back. Another factor in this is Deja Kelly. And if she stays or leaves at North stays or leaves North Carolina, right? They might be some sort of package deal. Like you got to look at that. If my significant other uh, was leaving school, I would probably be thinking about leaving as well. If my significant other was going to stay in school, I would heavily think about doing the same. That's not, not a factor. So we got to think about that. Another factor, NIL. That and I believe that RJ Davis next season would make more money as a North Carolina Tar Heel than he would pursuing professional things. Whether he makes an NBA roster, whether he's got a two-way contract just straight up in the G League playing overseas somewhere. You know, you think about it, all the attention Armando drew, he's kind of out the door. A lot of that is going to be going to other people. Um, TJ Beisner, the the director of the secondary break club is doing a great job getting the Tar Heels out there. I mean, you saw guys all over commercials during the NCAA tournament. So NIL is a critical factor if RJ cares about that side of things. Part of it, obviously, is does the NBA want RJ? When you look at mock drafts and NBA big boards, he's not typically on there. For ones that are extended, I've seen him out into like beyond the second round. And so, you know, there's the potential that he could slide his way into the back end. But as we all know, it's his height that kills RJ as a six footer. You know, if RJ was three to four inches taller, that's all it would take. No brainer. Absolute no brainer. But there are concerns about his size. And we've seen that some this year as bigger guards, longer guards have caused RJ some problems at times as teams have realized, oh, we can stifle some of RJ Davis's productivity by putting a bigger guy on him. Not always. Sometimes he's still, I mean, if he's on, he's on and you got to get out of the way. So that's a bunch of the factors that I've been thinking about with regard to RJ's decision. Obviously, I'm sure he is. And ultimately, he and his family have to make this decision for themselves. Ultimately, I believe that even if RJ is not on these NBA mock drafts, he should still declare for the NBA. I think that would be the single best thing for him. Now, declaring for the NBA while keeping the opportunity to return to Chapel Hill, that's the important caveat. There's absolutely no reason not to go test the NBA draft waters. Why wouldn't you want to learn more about what you can do from the, the ultimate version of the employer you want to work for, right? If, if they can tell you, hey, we like you, Here's three things we need you to go back to Chapel Hill and work on. Perfect. Tell me those things. Let me go work on that and get my best shot. Um, so, so there's that. And again, there's no reason not to do that. At, at worst, this is an opportunity to learn where he needs to grow other than physical height, which he can't help. And at best, he keep, he catches some team's eye and slides into the second round, which I know that's not at best for Carolina. But in some ways it is because it just shows that that development can get you where you need to go, even if you don't have all the physical attributes. Um, you got to consider how much RJ enjoys being a student. Would he want to come back? Would he want to do grad studies and grad work? All of this um, are the things that RJ Davis and those around him are going to decide. Now, I need to make a prediction because that's why we're here. My ultimate projection is that RJ Davis declares for the draft, gets a combine invite, which is a critical piece in that, shows well at the combine in an NBA draft uh, moments, but ultimately comes back for year five. Now, obviously, I have no insider knowledge on this right now. There's nothing we know from RJ or anything at all. That's just my projection is that he goes through the process, gets that invite, but ultimately decides to come back to Carolina. Now, Obviously, I could be dead wrong on that, but that's where I'm at today as of Wednesday, April 4th. Now, I would love for RJ to take as much time as he needs in this decision-making process, but you guys know the transfer portal moves quickly. So Carolina needs RJ Davis to make a decision as soon as he possibly can for the sake of next year's team. And if not, Carolina might be stuck between a rock and a hard place.
We'll discuss that more after I tell you that this episode is brought to you by Amazon Fire TV, which is your destination for sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug right into your existing TV to provide access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. So whether it's the tournament going on or the beginning of the MLB season, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. I've got Fire TV sticks on literally every TV in my house. I love the user experience. I love the interface, all of that. I love the even the little handy remote with buttons to take me straight to Disney or Hulu or whatever it is. Also, Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. And that includes all of us at the Locked On Podcast Network. Not to mention Fire TV has great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. So check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa-enabled devices. If you haven't done so, you should. Trust me on this. To learn more, visit amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. I want to continue the conversation about the RJ Davis decision-making process. He's had an unbelievable four years in Chapel Hill. But again, there's the possibility of the fifth. We've just talked about the RJ side of it. I'd actually like to turn our attention now to talking about the North Carolina side of this and what his timeline, the decision-making process could mean for the Tar Heels. Because ultimately, let me start by saying this, the sooner RJ can make a decision, he should announce that decision for the good of the program. And here's what I mean. Let's start by saying that a big part of last year's decision not to to, um, go to the NIT was based on Carolina wanting to get right to working on roster construction for this season. Paid off. Carolina was able to get multiple guys that they wanted to get. Get that roster construction moving as quickly as possible. But you see the issue here. I, I The longer that RJ and others have uncertainty or lack of decision-making, at least publicly, the harder it is for the coaching staff to put together the best team for the 2024-25 basketball season. So that's just part of the weird overlap of all these timelines for the transfer portal and the NBA draft um, entry process, the NBA withdrawal process. All of that makes this all the more difficult for Hubert Davis and his staff. Now, we know that RJ has already met with Coach Davis as Coach Davis has talked about meeting with all the players. So presumably, Coach Davis already knows where RJ is, at least where RJ is at right now. Whether RJ has made a decision or not is not for us to know yet. But we do know that Coach Davis at least knows where he's at and what he's processing right now. Um, Whether that means coming back or leaving or, Coach, I'm still working through the process and I haven't decided what I want to do yet. So the problem is in the meantime with all this, there's a lot of big time players that are going to come off the board. I mean, we've got multiple names on Tuesday, even Michi Johnson from South Carolina, their best score going to Ohio State. Um, Eddie Lampkin from Colorado, the big man. He's headed to Syracuse, something we're going to have to contend with next year. Kind of a DJ Burns model guy. This is why I think Carolina needs to go after a big, big. Right. And so as you see these players start to coming to come off the board, what that makes my brain start thinking or remembering is that RJ Davis is not so easily replaceable, folks. In fact, there is no one like RJ Davis, but you got to do your best to try to put someone in. But what that means is you can't just go grab anybody. So you don't you don't want to be stuck waiting a long time on on RJ's decision or anyone else because then you're going to miss out on guys that you otherwise probably could get. But you also, you don't want to jump the gun and go promising things to somebody in the transfer portal. And then, oh, look, RJ comes back. And now this guy that you brought in to be RJ's replacement is disgruntled because he's basically relegated to the bench or not as big a role as he had if RJ isn't there. So that's the catch 22. You want one of the best scorers in the history of the North Carolina program back on the team. 
but you want the decision sooner rather than later. And th- this is where it just gets sticky and tricky with these timelines. Speaking of the transfer portal, by the way, Bronny James is not in the transfer portal. I, I hope everyone, like there was that news and people just started retweeting it and it was like, homie came back and said, like, I can't verify that. I apologize. So just, just know that. But with RJ and trying to replace him, big time score, big time facilitator, seven assists in the loss to Alabama, big time team leader. He's been stepping up this season in a bunch of new ways. Good rebounder for his size. Most importantly, loves North Carolina, gets the culture and the team of North Carolina. He and Hubert Davis have a special relationship. He wants to be part of this, and that's what Hubert Davis wants. You can't just go get Johnny Q basketball player off the street and assume that he's got that same thing that RJ has. So so you see how this is tough for the Tar Heels? Now, I I would imagine that Hubert Davis is having all sorts of behind-the-scenes conversations in addition to knowing what RJ is doing, here's the type of conversation that's going on right now. Hey, point guard X. Hey, yeah, RJ is working on making this process or making this decision. Um, still a little bit unsure right now, but just wanted to check in with you and, and get your thoughts. Uh-huh, great. You want to go to the Pacific Northwest? Cool. You know, whatever it is. Oh, you're interested in coming here? Okay, well, let's keep conversations going. I'll keep you up to date with RJ's decisions and then we can go from there, right? Like those conversations are certainly happening. Okay, so all this to say at the end of the day, RJ Davis has a massive decision to make. But the sooner he makes that decision, the easier it will be for this school and this university that he loves so dearly. So RJ, blessings on whatever you decide, but help us all out and make it. (laughs) <laughs> and and even if that's RJ saying, I'm going to the NBA draft, but I'm going to maintain my eligibility. At least that gives Coach Davis more of an idea of what he's playing with. Now, regardless of RJ's decision, there are two incoming freshmen, Ian Jackson and Drake Powell, who were both on ESPN on Tuesday night playing in the McDonald's All-American game. And they were responsible for helping that East team close out a big time win. We'll talk about that in just a second. Right after I tell you about FanDuel, the sports calendar is loaded and FanDuel is making it even more exciting to get in on the action because right now new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's 200 bucks you can use to bet the tourney, MLB, NBA, NHL, and so much more. How about some national champion odds? Would love for Carolina to still be in that mix, but alas, they're not. UConn is clearly the favorite at minus 185. Purdue second at plus 185. Bama third at plus 1300. And NC State fourth at plus 2000. So if you want to get in on any of that action, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a big win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Tuesday night was the 2024 McDonald's All-American game. Two of North Carolina's three incoming freshmen were participants in that game, both playing for the East team. That's Ian Jackson and Drake Powell. Their team, the East, won 88-86. They had been down a lot in the game, had a nice comeback, and uh, fourth quarter was a little bit back and forth. But I tell you what, it was both of these guys making some key plays in that fourth quarter to help the team get the victory, including Ian Jackson kind of going off in the second half. The West missed a good look at three at the buzzer that would have given them the win. So we'll talk about their individual efforts here in just a second. But the place I want to start is what I think is the most critical thing that I took away from Tuesday night. And it is this. While they both put like Ian started, Drake came off the bench and each had minutes kind of in and out, whatever. Great. The critical thing for me in closing time in the fourth quarter, you've got these 12 young men on this roster. You have five of them in the game. Both Ian Jackson and Drake Powell were in for the closing stretch of this game. And that is what I love to see because amongst a group of 24 of the very best freshmen that will infiltrate college basketball next year. Two of Carolina's guys were two of the 10 that were out there to close out the game among all that talent. That says a lot about that, that coach's belief in them. That says a lot about what they're able to do amongst 
peers of the very best basketball players. And it's cool because they go at it in different ways with Ian. He is more ball dominant, more attacking, more athletic, more get out of the way. Here I come. Drake is just doing all these great intangible things that you need. Like, you know, you think about so much that Harrison Ingram has done this year to just affect winning. You think about so much that Leaky Black did to affect winning or Theo. It's like, that's the kind of stuff that Drake Powell is out there doing. And so I love that these two guys kind of bring these different opportunities and energies. And man, I love that they are Tar Heels and I'm excited to see what they can bring even their freshman year. And so, man, I just thought it meant so much and we can absolutely read into that how much belief people have in them that they were both two of the five uh, guys to close the game for their team. Speaking of which, there was this great sequence where it was Drake and Ian that changed the tenor of the fourth quarter and ultimately put their team ahead for good. It, was about, it started about 6.30 left in the game and went for about 90 seconds till there was about, uh, you know, uh, the next like 6.30 through five minutes left in the game. At that point, the East was down 74 to 68. At that point, Ian Jackson comes down, weaves through traffic, get a, gets a nice little layup on the right side of the rim. Drake Powell just kind of hangs around in the backcourt, just straight up steals the inbounds pass. Eventually, it gets back around to Ian Jackson, who comes back down, gets almost an identical layup to the one he had just hit. So now they're down just two. At this point, it's 74-72. So the West brings the ball up. Drake Powell is guarding on the wing. His, his man has the ball. He just swipes it, just straight up takes it from him. It was awesome. And then uh, the, the East goes down. Ian Jackson missed, but it was <laughs> he shook his guy, and it was awesome. But... Um, so they don't score there, but they held the West next possession. Ian Jackson uh, cuts baseline backdoor baseline. Nice feed from a different teammate, not Drake for uh, I think he had a dunk right there and that ties the game. Uh, but a couple possessions later, West had scored Drake Powell drives misses at the rim, but I honestly thought he was fouled and they didn't call it, but they, the, the East gets the offensive rebound. It's kicked out to Ian Jackson who buries a three to get uh, his lone three of the game to get the lead back. He hit a couple free throws, had another layup. Just Ian Jackson had a dominant second half from a scoring standpoint. Drake Powell had a dominant game from a, a defensive standpoint. He was clearly the best defender in this game because it wasn't just those two steals. There were other times where he was defending really well one-on-one, -on -one, just forcing bad shots from the West team. So I was really really encouraged to see from these guys. So let's take just a couple individual things from them. For Ian, as I said, he was one of the starters for the East. Let me give you his stat line. Played 26 minutes, 9 of 21 from the field. So not an incredibly efficient shooting day for Mr. Ian Jackson. 1 of 5 from 3, perfect at the free throw line. 2 of 2, finished with 21 points. That was second most on the East team. Uh, had a rebound two assists and a steal as well. And one of the things that I was kind of surprised to see um, was that Ian Jackson for a lot of the game was running point guard for the East. They had Boogie Fland. He came in and ran, ran point quite a bit and Ian moved off to the two guard. Um, so that makes me curious to see, like, I, I obviously don't think he will be expected to be that for North Carolina. Cause that will be Elliot. That will be RJ. If he's back, that will be Seth Trimble, whatever with that. But it's good to know. That if needed, Ian can be the ball handler, and, and that might be a good role for him as we think towards the NBA and, and what he could do after. But this dude is a dude. I love how aggressive he is. I love his willingness to attack. Again, amongst a group of peers of the most elite high school seniors, he's, he's not afraid to take the shots. Again, he was under 50%, not incredibly efficient, but he's out there doing it. So I'm curious to see with running the point, is that something he'll actually do for Carolina or just a function of the lineup that the East had on the court for a lot of this game? So, um, you know, obviously some, some good and some bad. That's what you expect in kind of an all-star game format. Like Ian got in too deep into the lane a couple times and couldn't get bailed out through a, a bad pass back out to the three point line, for example, but all in all, I, I loved what he was bringing that aggressiveness. Um, also, he had a nice steal and pick six in the second quarter. Um, so some good stuff there. Um, as for Drake, um, his stat line, 17 minutes, 
Um, didn't make a bucket, so didn't have any points because he didn't go to the free throw line either, but four rebounds and assist in those two steals we've already talked about. And so, again, Drake is one of those guys who you can't measure his impact on the game just by looking at these typical g- general box score numbers. You've got to actually watch the game to feel the impact of Drake Powell. So if you're a, a box score basketball watcher, that's not going to cut it. With Drake Powell, please go back and watch um, some footage from this game or some of his other highlights, and you'll see the ways he affects the game in a multitude of ways. Um, but but really liked his individual defense, his assist, um, and so good stuff there. Uh, by the way, Cooper Flag, who's going to Duke, best guy you know, rated right up there near the top. I think he actually got bumped down to second after one of the re uh, um, somebody reclassed down to 24, but uh, his, his outside shots kind of janky look in his form. If you saw that there was like a three pointer he made and I was like, it's eh, not very pretty. So we'll, we'll see if John Shire lets him shoot at all when he gets to do so. All right, guys. So big decisions to make for RJ Davis. Great showing from Ian Jackson and Drake Powell in the McDonald's all American game. You want to see that cannot wait to get those guys on campus sooner rather than later man it's gonna be great well that's it for today's episode great to be together sorry that pat kilby wasn't with me today we're actually recording on thursday so we'll be on friday's show together and then tomorrow on thursday coach rob will be with me so great stuff there if you haven't uh subscribed to the locked on tar heels discord community man you're missing out on that we'd love to come have you because there's going to be great conversations great community there even throughout Uh, kind of the sports downtime as we get into the summer. The link for that is in the show notes. It's free to join. We'd love to have you. If you haven't subscribed to the show on audio or video, please do that. Very simple to do if you're watching on YouTube. You just hit that subscribe button in the bottom corner. While you're there, hit the like button so we know you're here. Leave some comments on your thoughts on what you think RJ Davis should do. We'd love to know your ideas on that. Y'all, it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll be back again tomorrow, but until then, peace.